Great, so hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us in our continued webinars in UN Behavioral Science Week. Today we'll be talking about scaling behavioral science with uh, Professor John List, who we're very excited to have with us today. For those of you who haven't seen me around these webinars or been involved with uh, the work of the UN Behavioral Science Group, my name is Mary McLennan. I'm a behavioral scientist and I'm also the senior advisor in behavioral science in the executive office of the Secretary General, as well as lead an initiative called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which I'll speak to in a few moments, but just while colleagues are joining, I'll cover very briefly um, a little bit about UN Behavioral Science Week. So if you're here, there's a good chance you've seen the agenda, but if you haven't, I encourage you to check it out. We have uh, over, we have 18 entities participating in over 20 sessions. Um, to say as well, you know, we're on day four here on Thursday, so a lot have already happened, but they will be posted on our YouTube channel. So we'll share that with you as well if you want to catch up on ones that happened earlier on in the week. We have sessions ranging from health, climate, peace and security, gender. So no matter where you approach behavioral science from, I think um, there will be a session here for you. As well, all the sessions are free and open to all. We're hoping this is an inclusive discussion within the UN as well as beyond. So feel free to attend or share within your networks as well. So just very briefly about some of the efforts regarding behavioral science across the UN systems. So as I mentioned, I lead the UN Behavioral Science Group, which is hosted by the UN Innovation Network uh, and is supported by the Executive Office of the Secretary General. So we bring together over a thousand colleagues across the UN system from over 60 entities in 110 countries. So there's no shortage of enthusiasm and interest in the application of behavioral science. Uh, colleagues range from those who are interested in getting started and thinking about how they can apply behavioral science to their work at sort of the early stages, through to ones who are actually behavioral scientists themselves. So we have a wide spectrum. That being said, most are at the early stages of their journey. So really thinking about uh, how to apply behavioral science in their first project, or maybe going from one project to another in sort of the early stages of their thinking. So we support entities and colleagues uh, through bringing them together, both within the UN as well as out colleague, bringing in colleagues from outside. We also provide thought leadership and light touch support on projects. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions about this in the chat. My colleague, Johanna, is there. She runs the UN Innovation Network more broadly and works with me very closely to run the UN Behavioral Science Group, so um, she can answer any questions you might have. Just very briefly, uh, if you've been engaged with behavioral science in the UN over the last few years, you've probably heard about some of the statements from the Secretary General with respect to applying it in the UN system overall. So the Secretary General has called it a critical tool and also had called on entities to invest in behavioral science, as well as for colleagues to work together in a collaborative and interagency way. So if you're interested in knowing more about this, I would encourage you to check out the UN Secretary General's guidance note, which was published last year. We led in the development of it, and um, it covers a lot of uh, the vision, really, and how we're thinking about applying behavioral science in the UN over the coming months and years uh, to increase its application. Uh, just to say a bit of a call to action here before we get to our speaker, which is why we're all here today. So if you'd like to engage with uh, behavioral science in the UN, this is sort of three things to get started. So first, uh, read the Secretary General's guidance note on behavioral science. There's also the UN Behavioral Science Report, which covers the experiences of 25 UN entities, as well as some enablers for applying behavioral science within entities and across the UN. And then lastly, just this week, we launched the UN Practitioner's Guide to Getting Started with Behavioral Science. So this is a guide, again, really geared toward those at the early stages of their journey, which is the majority of the group. So it leverages thinking from academia, governments, international organizations of the last decade in this space, which has been essentially since the field uh, began in practice. We've tailored it to the UN context. So I encourage you to check it out and again, engage with us if you'd like more detail or um, information on, on the guide itself. Uh, as well, join the UN Behavioral Science Group. As I mentioned, we're over a thousand colleagues in the UN. Uh, anyone can join and it only takes a couple minutes on our website. If you are outside the UN and you'd like to join, you can do so as an observer. Uh, you can get keep up to date on what we're doing as well as engage in opportunities as they arise when to, to engage with people outside the UN. Um, and again, you can do that on our website. And lastly, uh, follow us on Twitter if you want more real-time engagement. You can do that at UN underscore BSI or UN underscore innovation. So with that, I'm going to stop here. I could continue on, but I'm excited for our speaker today. Um, so the session will be run uh, in this way. So we'll have our speaker go for about 15 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes. 
And then we'll have a lot of time for Q&A with all of you. I know there are lots of questions in this space of scaling. Um, you all come to me with them and now we're going to the expert to talk about them in more detail. Um, so we're asking to put your questions in the Q&A box. So not the chat, I, I'm not going to be looking in the chat closely so your question might get lost. So in the Q&A box, and also you can upvote the questions of your colleagues. So we're hoping this discussion is really one that resonates across the audience. So if you, even if you don't have one yourself, uh, please vote on the questions that are in the Q&A box. And with that, on to our speaker for today. So we're very fortunate to have with us Professor John List, who's the Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. So Professor List works at the interface of research and practice. He's a really good example of academics who are taking their research and applying it in the real world. Um, he has over 20 years of experience working in field experiments, incredibly prolific author. He's over 250 academic journal articles, as well as published several books in the space, one of which he'll speak to you today. Um, he's also run, um, been involved in a lot of, of practical work too, as I mentioned. So he's been on the Council of Economic Advisors in the US government, as well as been the chief economist of companies like Uber and Lyft. So um, he can speak to some of that experience as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor List uh, to share his uh, thoughts on scaling behavioral science. Uh, over to you. Awesome. Uh, Mary, thanks so much. And Mary and Johanna, thanks so much for organizing this great event. And I see there are a bunch of participants here. So, so thanks everyone for attending. As Mary mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a book today. And I'll talk for about 15 minutes and then love to have a conversation with all of you, not only just about the book, but if you want to talk more generally about field experiments or about policymaking, what have you, economics, I'll, I'm willing to entertain any questions that you all have. Okay, so I'm going to set up a tour de force here and try to put some slides up. Let's see if I can get this to work. Mary or Johanna, is this, does this look okay? Yes, looks great. All right, all right. So here's the book, The Voltage Effect. And what I want to focus on for the next 15 minutes is the policy side of the voltage effect. And I think this is a question that a lot of you ask every day. All of you are trying to change the world for the better. You're trying to use science to change the world. And you do something in a village or in a city or in a country and you think, will that idea or will that policy scale? Today, I'm gonna to tell you about the story that I've gone through in the last few decades around scaling. And I can affirmatively tell you that it's fair to say when I started working in this area, that scaling was all about art. And, and what I mean by that is in the business world, it was move fast and break things. It was throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, cook it. It was fake it till you make it. These are all pieces of artwork. And when I worked in government, as Mary mentioned, I worked in the White House for a few years. And oftentimes we talked about scaling, but it was always art and it was never based on science. So if you take nothing from the talk today, my 15 minutes, I want you to take just one thing. You can take nothing else, take one thing. This guy is trying to add science to scaling. I think the act of implementation and scaling up is the most important, let's say piece of the puzzle that we have yet to solve. We have a lot of solutions, a lot of solutions that work in some settings, but we know very little about whether those solutions will work in other settings. And we know very little about what is the science of those expectations. That's what the book is about, the voltage effect. Okay, so let's talk about my scaling road. Back in 2007, a community here in Chicago named Chicago Heights, it's a community that's about 20 miles straight south of Chicago, asked me to help them. This is a community where 95% of residents are on federal food stamps. So this is a community that 50 years ago was a great manufacturing town. And now a lot of those jobs have left. 
So they ask me for my help. Now, when a community like this asks you for help, of course, we're all humane humans. The, the question isn't whether you should help or not, it's where should I start? And where I started was I built a pre-K school. So I started building a pre-K school. Now, what I mean by pre-K is this is a school for three, four, and five-year-olds. In America, school is not compulsory until six or seven. So I wanted to build a pre-K school to, first of all, help Chicago Heights residents I wanted to learn about the education production function at a young age. And what I mean by that is I wanted to learn about what are the best ways that we can teach our children at three, four, and five that will lead them to have great outcomes, get them through high school and get them into college. So we started building that in 2008. And in 2014, the results start to arrive. And I can promise you back in 2014, I was exhilarated. The results looked great. We were moving kids from the south side of Chicago to the north side of Chicago within five or six months. And what that might not mean anything to you, think about going from the 30th percentile to the 55th percentile in six months. That's what we were finding. We're finding these great results on both cognitive test scores and executive function skills. So I was super excited. We were helping Chicago Heights. We were writing academic papers and the papers were getting published in great economics journals. So then of course, I wanted to change the world. And I wanted to let everyone know, we have a great program here and I want every kid in the world to have my program. Makes sense, right? That's why we do this. That's why we're doing science is to, change the world. So at this point, I started to talk to policymakers. I started to go to federal policymakers, state policymakers. Now, let me be clear. I'm not selling anything. I'm giving away the program for free. Okay, so I'm taking it to them saying, this is a scientifically tested early childhood program. Please use it. Here comes the slap in the face. Typically, policymakers would say something along the lines of, quote, Professor List, your program had an impressive benefit profile, but don't expect it to happen at scale. Now, as Mary mentioned, I've been around a long time. I started to do field experiments in the early 90s, and I had never been met with this criticism. So I said, why? Why don't you think my program will scale? And they typically said, well, it doesn't have the silver bullet. And I would say, well, what is the silver bullet? And what do you mean by this? And then they would say something along the lines of, quote, all of the experts tell us their interventions will work, but treatment results aren't close to what they promise. Okay, now there is a lot of important relevant ideas in this discussion. So this caused me to pause. And I stepped back and started thinking, throughout my career, this has been a common discussion. In the White House, nearly every policy we had this discussion about, it worked in New Jersey, but will it work for the rest of America? It worked in San Diego, will it work for the rest of America? At the time, 2014, 2015, I was a chief economist at Uber. We were having this kind of discussion nearly every day. We had a great idea in one market. What do we think? Do we think it's gonna scale to other markets and will it be as effective? The scaling issue was coming up all the time in business. And then I started thinking about my partnerships with other firms, nonprofits and for-profits. And in every one of those cases, we had a scaling discussion. So I started then to think, well, in all of those settings, how are they looking and viewing scaling? And it all came together in this cartoon. You know, you have a bunch of math and then in the middle, this fellow says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two, that's scaling. 
we, we have an idea in the Petri dish, and then we think it's going to scale, and then it's going to go up here and do great things. So what I did was I started to write academic papers. I started to write theoretical papers on scaling. And these are papers that I call the science of using science. And if any of you would like these academic papers, I'll be happy to send those to you. Just shoot me an email. I started to test those theoretical papers with empiricism. And I started to learn about the science of scaling. And I've written now probably two dozen academic papers, but I realized that as I wrote them, very few people were reading them, right? When I write an academic paper, you want to change the world with it, but if only four people are reading it, you're not gonna change the world unless they're the perfect four, which usually they aren't. So that's what caused me to write the popular book the voltage effect, what I wanted to do is I wanted to unlock the secrets in the academic journals and in my academic papers. And I wanted to take out all of the math, take out all of the jargon, which I call economies, because not all of us speak economies. I wanted to take that all out and write a layperson's view of here's what we've learned about the science of scaling. Okay, so for the next five or so minutes, I want to just give you a quick summary of, of what the book does. So you might want, be wondering, you know, were those policymakers correct? And they were correct. That's what I call the first law of scaling. Because 99% of the time, when you move from the small to the big, the results will be different. But in my book, I show that why they're different, and they they are predictably different. Now, an analogy about voltage that you might want to think about, it's when we scale up, that's what I think about higher voltage, that's what enables our ideas to move to many people and locations. Okay, that's the way I think about high voltage. And that's what we all want to do with our ideas. Now you might ask, okay, the policymakers were correct. There's a voltage effect. When you move from the small to the large, it changes a lot. And most of the time it goes down, okay? Sometimes it goes up, most of the time it goes down. But then you can ask, well, what about the silver bullet idea? That's where they were exactly wrong. This is not a silver bullet problem. This is an Anna Karenina problem. And what I mean by Anna Karenina, for all of you who are not Tolstoy fans, and those who are Tolstoy fans, I want you to think about the first line in Anna Karenina. Remember what Tolstoy said was, happy families are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Now, for all of us on here who have families, we know that families are unhappy for an infinite number of reasons. So Tolstoy has a, a dimensionality problem. I don't. Um, scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way, but there are five reasons why any idea will not scale. And that's what I call the five vital signs. Okay, so in the book, the first half of the book brings forward these five vital signs. And I want you all to think about my idea or my policy does it pass these five vital signs? Then you have a shot to scale. If it doesn't pass the five vital signs, you should either recognize that this isn't going to scale as broadly, or you should go back and tweak your idea. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go, since I only have three more minutes left, I'm not going to go through all the vital signs one by one, but here they are. Um, number one, false positives, is in many cases, we try to scale ideas that never have voltage. They should never have been scaled. Number two, know your audience. This is about horizontal scaling. It works for one group of people in one area. Can we horizontally scale it to other types of people? That's what I call know your audience. The third vital sign, chef for the ingredients. This is combining horizontal scaling with vertical scaling. So what I mean by that is I want to go across space and then within the same space, scale it up. 
So now this is about not only people, it's about situations. Is the original idea carried out in a way where it's using inputs that are available at scale? It's about properties of the situation. Number four is about spillovers. Most of our ideas have spillover effects. The fifth one is the supply side of scaling. Does your idea have economies of scale? Okay, so I wanna dig in just for a little bit on vital sign number three. And, and this is very important, I believe, for all of you. I think when I give talks, a lot of times people say, John, we've been at poverty alleviation for decades. Why haven't we put a dent in it? I think it's because as scientists, we are answering the wrong question. Here's what I mean by that. So today's approach is we typically have a program and we do an A-B test. And when I say A-B with a dash of respondent heterogeneity, that means maybe men and women are affected differently by it or different races are affected differently or different ages, okay? But anyway, we do an A-B test. In this case, we find that B is better than A. But typically that A-B test is an efficacy test. What we're doing is we're using unique inputs. We're using the best of class typically. And then we write up that academic paper and we forget to tell everyone else that it was an efficacy test. Efficacy tests are done for academic purposes. They should not be done for scaling purposes. Okay, so here's my simple solution. What I want you to do is I want you to add option C. I want you to think about option C is you should add critical scale features. So what are the constraints that I will face at scale? And I wanna bring those back to the original experiment. So I'm fine doing an efficacy test, that's A, B, but add to that efficacy test option C which is taking into account the constraints you will face at scale. Think about my program, Chicago Heights Early Childhood, the CHECK program. One of the critical features I'm gonna face at scale is I'm not gonna be able to hire very good teachers if I wanna vertically scale that program. Why? Because in that program, I only had to hire 30 teachers. What happens if you have to hire 30,000 teachers? quality is going to give, especially if you want to keep the budget the same. So if the quality gives, now I'm going to have lower quality teachers. But I didn't have that in check. I should have recognized that, and that would have been my option C. It would have been, does my program work with the types of teachers I'm going to have to hire at scale? Okay. Now, another way I want you to think about this is I'm introducing what I call policy-based evidence. Okay, so this is all in chapter three in the book, but policy-based evidence is you take the situational features that you will have at scale and you bring them back to the Petri dish. That's what we should be striving for if we're interested in changing the world. It's policy-based evidence, not evidence-based policy. That's the wrong way to think about scaling. That's the way to think about academic publications and efficacy tests. Okay, so quickly, the back half of the book, chapter six, talks about incentives at scale. Here I talk about things like always use non-financial incentives. Those are the best incentives in an org or around an idea that can scale. Then I talk about revolution on the margins. That's just about how to think on the margin. And then chapters eight and nine, I talk about winners quitting and I talk about culture. And culture here, this is about uh, gender diversity and inclusiveness and how organizations and ideas should be formed around a culture that can truly scale. And that's a diverse and inclusive culture. Okay. So the back half is kind of like, how do we use economics to make better decisions and to think about keeping our idea at very, very high voltage after we launch it. Okay. And that's the voltage effect in a, uh, in a mock a little bit over time which I apologize for, but, but that's the book. And I'll stop sharing now. Great, thank you very much for those remarks, Professor List. I think there's lots that we can take away, especially those five vital signs 
I think there are things that we often think about, but it's great to see it all kind of right, the way you packaged it is so useful. Um, and I see we have colleagues with us from UN Women, from UNDP, from USAID, and other other parts of the of the UN is, and outside as well. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. I know you have all faced challenges with scaling, and we have John with with us today. So even if you want to speak about a specific project, we'd be happy to. Well, I'm, I'm volunteering, Professor List, to talk a little bit about Absolutely. specific projects Absolutely. if you would like to to ask a question. So before we get to the audience questions, I have a few myself based on some things that we've heard across the UN system. So it's unpacking some things in particular that you mentioned. So on the last few slides there, you spoke about in chapter six incentives. So um, thinking about behavioral science in particular, uh, could you maybe give uh, some examples or an example of um, incentives that scale and lessons we might be able to learn from this as relevant to the UN context? You know, we work across a wide geographical a variety of areas as well as promotion of social good in the SDGs. So incentives that scale, yeah. do you have some examples? Yeah. No, absolutely, think? absolutely. So in this chapter, I want you to think about two types of incentives. One would be non-financial incentives. So I talk a little bit about when we rolled out tipping in the Uber app. So back when I was a chief economist at Uber in 2017, there was no chance to tip people. And, and my team rolled it out. In the summer of 2017, we rolled out the fact that you could now give a tip to the driver um, within right after the trip. And what we observed there is that only 1% of people tip on every trip. And the other side of the coin is three out of five people never ever tip. But then we did another experiment where we took those three out of five people who never ever tip on an Uber, and we observed them in a yellow taxi cab, where, where these are taxis where you get the trip, and then at the end, you pay in cash, or you pay with a credit card face-to-face. -face. Guess what happens now? 95% of them tip. These are the powers of social norms and social image and social pressure. These are the types of incentives that do a really good job at scale because they're ubiquitous. And a lot of them traverse cultures too. You know, we, we have work that shows which types of norms are constant across cultures and which aren't. But the general idea here is non-financial incentives are very powerful. Now on the other side, if you wanna really dig into behavioral economics, we, we innovated on the side of what's called a clawback. So in, in Chicago Heights with teachers, how we, how we paid them is we told them, if your students achieve at the end of the year, we will give you a bonus. Okay, that's typically how people do bonuses, right? You work really hard at the end of the year, you get a bonus. Then we took another group of teachers and we gave them the money, the bonus money up front. And we told them, if you don't achieve, we're gonna take some or all of it away at the end of the year. Guess what happens? That's called a clawback and people have loss aversion. That's one of the pillars of behavioral economics that people dislike losses much more than they like gains. So what happens here? Teachers work a lot harder to help their students so they can keep their bonus. That's a way of framing things like pay and bonuses and that scales well too. So these are just two examples from the chapter about how we can think about from a behavioral economics perspective, how we can think about using incentives that can scale in our organization. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. And I, yeah, we see in the chat here, love the use of loss Thanks aversion. So you're, you. you're speaking the language of many of the people who are enthusiastic about behavioral science with us today. Um, so picking up on that a little bit further, you mentioned horizontal scaling, and this is something that comes up quite a bit in the UN, scaling across countries or scaling in different contexts, but shown to work in one area. Um, so given the, large, given the UN's large potential reach and eagerness to do this, what would you suggest colleagues keep in mind? And I know you've spoken a little bit yeah. about this. And then building upon that as well, to what extent do you think the UN should carry out multi-country or multi-site yeah. experiments? And if we were to do this, which is obviously, as you, as you very well know, a huge undertaking, yeah. what would be the benefit of this? What value could we derive that we don't necessarily know from what we can do in all, already? Yeah, 100%. Mary, that's great. That, that, that's a wonderful question. I want you to think about how can we generate as useful and informative of information and data 
as quickly as possible. Okay, so the first step I would say is right away, regardless of your space, let's just say you're in one country. I would want to start right away with a multi-site trial. And that's useful right away because you can immediately find, does it have a differential effect across people? But you can also learn about, are there specific situations that are causing the result to have a bigger or smaller effect? And from that, you start to, there, I talk about this in chapters two and three, how right away I want you to immediately embrace I, I, I want to be as informative as possible on both the people I can help and the situations I can help in, because those are going to be informative about how broadly you can scale. And so, for example, in Chicago Heights, we found we had we developed a, a parent academy. What we found is the parent academy only really works for Hispanic families. It didn't work very well at all for white or black families. That's important because when I scale the Parent Academy, I should scale those just to Hispanic families, but now I need to come up with an innovation for the white and black families. I need to find something new. And that was important to find out early because one size doesn't fit all. People are starting to focus on heterogeneity of people themselves, but we also need to think about heterogeneity of the situation itself. It does at scale or in this new region, am I gonna have the same level of inputs? If it's a teacher, if it's a home visitor, if it's a whatever, are, are the inputs gonna be the same as what they were in the Petri dish? And when you do, now let's talk about cross country. I would love to be part of an enterprise that said, look, we have some ideas for solutions. We're not sure if they're gonna scale. We're gonna do it at a small level across a lot of different countries and learn. And then if things look really good, we're gonna scale that up if the idea has all of the features of the five vital signs. And you learn very quickly that way through a multi-site trial about the types of people and the types of situations it works for. If it's not up to snuff, revise and resubmit, right? We get a new idea and, and let's do it again. But the UN has a distinct comparative advantage that nobody else in the world has. You have the ability to learn quickly and across space and situations what works and why. That's your unique advantage. And you should be taking advantage of that. That's why Uber, what we did at Uber could work because we're in every market. And the fact that we're in every market around the world, we could learn quickly. And then we could innovate fast. And that's a unique advantage. I'm now the chief economist at Walmart. And I started at Walmart about a month and a half ago. That's a unique advantage that Walmart has is there in so many markets, I can quickly test and retest and figure out does it work and why and who does it work for and when. UN has to take advantage of that comparative advantage. Thank you for the impassioned plea for this uh, cross country. <laughs> And I think the other argument we often speak to is, you know, we have all these, we're investing currently in projects that may not be working. So we could put that, the opportunity cost of these resources, right? If we just know what works. And I love that, that you just brought that up. I love yeah. that you brought that up because whenever I talk to orgs, they say experimentation is too costly. Mm. It's the exact opposite problem. The real opportunity cost is time. Every day you go by, by having a program that doesn't work, that's the true cost here because we're not able to change people's lives in a meaningful way because we have programs that don't work. Let me be honest with you. Most programs don't work. It's just that we haven't gotten around to figure that out. But once we do that, we're gonna realize the opportunity cost of time, the opportunity cost of not knowing the truth about the program not working, that's the true cost here. It's not the trivial cost of running the experiment. That's trivial, let's face it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a huge potential for lots of work in this space. So hopefully we can continue this discussion with some of the other colleagues in the chat too. Just So I have a last question for you before we get to questions from uh, the audience. So you mentioned um, this culture of scaling. It's one of the chapters of your book and, and you spoke to, um, spoke to that. It was quite interesting. Um, so what lessons or recommendations might you have for you and entities to promote more systemic uh, 
responsible scaling within their organization. So I know it's a whole chapter, yeah. but if you wanted to give yeah, it no, gosh, a little bit. Yeah, no, gosh, gosh. I, I think there are two kinds of things I want you to think about with culture. Um, one is your culture around decision-making. Most orgs that I have been a part of have been top down. This is my gut feeling about what we should do. And the new breed of firms and orgs, I think, are the ones that say data is our DNA. And it's going to be data that is driven by the bottom, so to speak, people like me at the bottom. And then that goes up and it drives decision making on the on the side of the decision-making culture, I want it to be data is our DNA. Now, the other side of culture is the org and the inclusiveness and how we respect and, and work together because orgs and ideas can only truly grow if they're diverse and inclusive. And I present a lot of evidence about what are the best ways to get the, the top women to come into your org? And it starts with the manner in which we write our job advertisements. And I show research of my own about what you can write down to get a more diverse and selection of top talent. There is rampant discrimination around the world if certain types of people, basically all non-white males, right, are, are discriminated against in some form. And that needs to change and our cultures need to be diverse because that's how true solutions and path-breaking work ends up making it to scale. So that's the other kind of culture, the, the culture that we wanna build within our org and around our ideas. And chapter nine talks about both of those types of cultures. Great, thank you for that. I'm sure there's lots more we can explore also just to say as well, yesterday we had Iris Bonet with us we spoke quite a bit about diversity in organizations and the importance of that. So great to hear you echoing. Those yeah, she's wonderful. Well. Absolutely. Yeah, she was, she was great. Um, okay. So I'm going to stop asking questions. I can keep going, but I'm going to turn it over to the audience here and we can give you the floor to ask the question directly to our speaker, if you'd like. So the first one we have is from Ananya. Um, so you can unmute yourself. If you'd like to ask your question directly to our speaker. I'd love to see you Ananya. If I could see you too. Not sure we can enable that. Oh, can't we enable that? Rats. Okay, Ananya, I'm, I'm just going to have a mental vision uh, of you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good evening. I'm Ananya. I'm connecting from India. Uh, so my question, Professor List, is that, um, I mean, if you could elaborate more on the vertical and horizontal scaling that you were talking yeah. about um, with certain like examples from Uber or Walmart or your work with the government. So that will like make the concept understanding clearer. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Ananya. Thank you. Okay. Let, let, let's stay within the Chicago Heights example. And I think that will make it very clear. So when I think of horizontal scaling, okay, remember our Petri dish was Chicago. We, we did an experiment in Chicago with Chicago children and their parents. When I think about horizontal scaling, I say, okay, it worked in Chicago, Will it work in New York? Will it work in Washington, DC? Will it work in LA? Will it work in Delhi? Will it work in London? So horizontal scaling is primarily a concept that is across space. So across markets of people you could think about and across input markets. So what I mean by that is in Chicago, I had to hire 30 good teachers for my program my bet is when I move to New York, I can hire 30 good teachers. And I, when I go to DC, I can find 30 good teachers. That's horizontal scaling. Okay, vertical scaling is, let's say instead of going horizontally, I wanna stay in Chicago and put together 20,000 early childhood programs. So that means, guess what? I have to hire 60,000 or 600,000 or whatever number of teachers from the same input market. So before I had to hire 30 teachers around Chicago, that's easy. What about hiring 30,000 good teachers around Chicago? That's vertically scaling because I'm staying within the same market, but I'm trying to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Our ideas need to have features that are horizontally scaled and vertically scaled. Sometimes we maybe only want to do one of them. That's fine. Sometimes we might want to do both of them. That's fine. Chapter two and three in the book is about horizontal and vertical scaling and features of your idea that you need to look at if you're going after one or both of those types of scaling exercises. Ananya, does that help? It does. I mean, just to um, clarify towards the end. So we, can we say like horizontal is somewhat, somewhat like long, longitudinal scaling while vertical can be like cross-sectional? Sorry, the other way around. Horizontal. Yeah, well, well, yeah okay. So, so if you want to think about temporal, I, I want you to, my explanation is orthogonal or uncorrelated to timing. But, but let's talk about timing for a minute. Mine is just about, look, do you want to go across markets or do you want to stay within the same market? Okay. Anytime you scale, of course, it's going to take time, right? So that's why I want to put timing on the sidelines, because both of those exercises, you are doing it right away in the Petri dish. And then over time, you're either expanding horizontally or vertically. So they both have a time element. Now let's go to time, because time ends up being important in your considerations, because you might want to say, look, I have this idea that the benefit flow is gonna happen in the distant future. That, that's, that's important for either vertical or horizontal scaling. And you take that into account in your decision-making, but, but that's all elements of scaling involve time, but you have to figure out how you wanna discount benefits and costs. That's a big argument in climate change, right? When I was working back in the White House, the big argument was, should we do something about climate and if we have a large enough discount rate, what that means is you discount the future at a really big rate. Then people were saying, we shouldn't do anything about climate change. But other people kind of on my side that were saying we should do something about climate change is we shouldn't discount the future that much. Future generations should be nearly as important, if not as important as us. And then that would say you should do it. You should scale up climate change. So that I, I think of the timing of it is it's complementary to what I'm arguing about vertical or horizontal, but but it's slightly different types of arguments, Ananya. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Professor List. Thanks for your question. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank you so much for your question. I see in the chat we had a few comments saying that was a very clear explanation. Um, oh, good. So, yeah. so you've done a great job there. I'm very impressed with these complicated economic concepts. You're breaking down to these really simple, simple terms. Okay. So on to our next uh, question. So I'll turn it over to Thomas Dudek. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and which organization you're from and uh, ask your question. I see you have a few questions, so maybe condense them if you would like to uh, ask to Professor List. Hi, yeah, I'm Thomas. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm not sure. Of the yeah, hi, Thomas, we can hear you. I, uh, yeah, I'm Thomas. I'm from the University of Trier in Germany. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I had a couple of questions, but I'll just- Thomas, we know one another, don't we? I don't know. I don't think so. You look very familiar. Do I? Uh, I yeah, I don't know, but we, I don't think we've talked to each other. Before. Okay, well, it's great to meet. It's great to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yes, thanks. Uh, so I will just ask this one question, which um, is about the spillover effects. Yeah. And you talked about those uh, when you said, uh, talked about the five vital signs. And I'm not clear what you mean by a spillover effect. If you yeah. may have an, an example of a recent project where a spillover effect was important and um, yeah. What Absolutely, you... Thomas, that's great. Can I give you a three to five minute soliloquy about the different kinds of spillovers? Cause I think this is useful for this group. So Thomas, thanks happy. for your question. Yeah, I talk about four kinds of spillovers in this chapter but let me just give you a few of them. Um, one of them, think about Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center. Um, what happened there is kids in the control group, if they lived nearby enough treatment kids, it was like they were in treatment themselves. So, so that's one kind of spillover is when the treatment group gets good stuff and then their good stuff spills over to the control group. Okay, now what does that mean for scaling? That means that my initial results are too pessimistic. Because when we scale that thing, it's going to have a much better benefit cost profile because there are going to be spillovers from treatment to treatment kids. 
instead of treatment to control. So that's one kind of spillover. In, in economies, that's called a sutva violation, by the way, Thomas. So don't have that in your experiments. Um, another kind of spillover happened to us at Uber. So at Uber, remember I talked about tipping before. And the thing about tipping is kind of interesting because that summer of 2017, we ran an experiment where we only allowed 5% of the drivers in the Chicago market to receive tips. So here's what happened. Those 5% of drivers received tips, they worked more, and they made more per hour. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Okay, that fall, we scaled up from 5% of drivers to 100% of drivers who could receive tips. Guess what happened? They all worked more, but they drove around with an empty car more often, and they undid all of the good stuff of the tip in the 5% group because the market came to a new equilibrium and their wages were identical after tipping as before tipping. So that's kind of a market-wide spillover that happens when everyone got treated, all of the good stuff that we had in the 5% experiment went away. Okay, Thomas, so that's another kind of spillover that's at the market level. The third kind of spillover I want you to think about is a Peltzman effect. So back in the 60s, there was a federal regulation in America that made seatbelts mandatory. Okay, 1968, the federal government said every new automobile has to have a seatbelt. And they said, it's going to save a bunch of lives. So my colleague, Sam Peltzman, did some work in the mid-70s that showed that exactly zero lives were saved because of that seatbelt law. Now, you might say, well, what happened? What he found is people who wore seatbelts drove more aggressively. So that's another kind of behavioral spillover. So I've just, I've just shown you three types of spillovers. And there's a fourth one in the chapter, but I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an economist, so I understand incentives. So I don't wanna <laughs> give away everything, Thomas, but those are three kinds of important spillovers. Uh, that's right, Philippa, that, that's called moral hazard. And in, in uh, moral, so folks, moral hazard is, think about insurance. After you're given insurance, you act more aggressively because you don't absorb all the costs of your actions. That's what moral hazard is. That's, that's exactly right. So Thomas, thanks for your question. Thank you very much, Professor Liz. Thanks for that. That's, those are all incredibly compelling examples. You know, often in behavioral science, broadly across the UN, we talk about whenever we test things or try things, you know, it's great to leverage these principles, but we have to think about spillovers. So this is a key component to a lot of the, the broader work that we think about. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a question from an anonymous attendee. So um, I, I will I'll read it as best uh -oh, I can. Is this <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's nothing too too scary or controversial. Not need to worry. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we face in the UN is that we're so disconnected. So we have different organizations. As you said, or when we're 60 entities in the UN Behavioral Science Group, I think there are over 80 in the UN system, um, different countries. So it makes it hard to know about successful projects which makes scaling them even harder. Yeah. So do you have any advice on how to share or and how to at least start to overcome this sort of yeah. this barrier in terms of knowing what's been done and what hasn't been done? Yeah, gosh, that's a great question. And, and let me, I have two observations. One, you're not alone. Every org I've worked in, like think about Uber. We were in the same building, but there were like 12 silos. And we didn't know there were there was duplicity. Uh, there was secrets because people wanted to hold information. And there was an incredible amount of inefficiency because we didn't have a good approach to overcome these information asymmetries. And we didn't have a good approach as a clearinghouse to learn. When I moved to Lyft, same thing at Lyft. Lyft is smaller, but same thing. I've been at Walmart now for a month and a half, same thing. If you think more broadly, we have the same problem in, in the academy, that we have a lot of secrets hidden in journals, and there aren't people who are bringing out those secrets and writing about them in an accessible way. That's why I wrote The Voltage Effect. Okay, 
No, that's the problem. We're kindred spirits. I'm not a person who says a problem without proposing a solution. Here's my solution that I'm trying at Walmart. I need a clearing house. And what I mean by that is I need a clearing house person who is willing to work and discuss results, innovations, ideas across groups at Walmart, synthesize those and have the ability to write about those in an accessible way. In, in the academy, we call these translators. You need a translator or a person who is charged with overcoming these information asymmetries because left to yourself, you're not gonna do it. You don't have the time because you have monkeys crawling at you all over. You have 20 people reporting to you. You can't hardly do your own job. You don't have time to take care of the translation of things or the synthesis of things. So what I'm gonna try at Walmart is that. And, and I do agree. That's one of the most important informational asymmetries that I've observed across organizations. And if we have that problem at Uber and Lyft and we had it in the White House even, you're gonna have that in the UN in a much bigger way where people speak different languages, people have different objective functions, People are doing things in a different way. People have different goals and aspirations. You need a synthesizer. So for me, I call this the scale unit. And the scale unit can be that synthesizer. So I, I wrote an op-ed the other day that came out in the Hill that was why all orgs need a scaling unit. And that scaling unit can be the translator and synthesizer because they're taking information from across the org and they're sharing it. And I promise that newsletter will be the most popular newsletter in the org because everyone will be waiting to see what are we missing and, and what can we learn from that group? So I love that question. That question's ubiquitous. And I, I don't understand why we haven't been able to take, because to me, it's like, we, we need translators, we need synthesizers, but orgs have not been willing to fund those. But you need that funded. Uh, it's very true. I mean, if we're taking this idea of what works seriously, I mean, this is this is essential I mean, to, to undertake it. And just um, from some anecdotes, I used to work in government um, and we had a really interesting part of government that just did literature reviews for us. And it was really, it, was, it wasn't quite what you're proposing. This is much more suited, but at least it was something. So I'm policy Absolutely. making and oftentimes you make decisions quickly. So, um, so this, is, this is very interesting and we'll check out your op-ed and maybe check have further yeah, discussions what... about it. Um, going forward. So we only have a few minutes left, but I'm going to turn it to um, Caitlin. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question directly to Professor List, um, you can do so. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks for joining. Yeah, of course. Thank you um, for presenting a great topic. Thanks. I um, always think about how to scale um, both vertically and horizontally, but also about geographies like yeah. space and also across time. Yeah. One thing I'm curious about is, um, you know, programs have a lot of different solutions packed into them at once. Yeah. And A-B testing is just one kind of way to get at or That's try right. to get at causality. Um, but when we have a lot of different solutions at once, yeah. it can be a little bit difficult to discern like these, these yeah. kinds of complexities. And so I'm just curious about the kinds of insights you have regarded to these complexities and um, things, that, things that are, are prone to evolve. Yeah, you, you're 100% right. I, I, to me, an A-B test is the beginning, not the ending. And, and for one reason that you just brought up it is, is chief amongst why that's true in my mind is that an A-B test tends to be a program that is an amalgamation of several different pieces. And when you run that, you're not sure which pieces are compulsory, which pieces are really doing the work, and which pieces are working for which people. So I think about the A-B test, now I'm, I'm gonna say ABC, by the way, as a way to start the conversation. And then I would want you to unpack a few things. One, why, why does that work? Why does the program work? And that's what you're hinting at. 
is what are the pieces of the program that are causing it to work? Now, this involves both mechanisms or mediation paths. And when I think of a mediation path, now, Caitlin, I'm not sure if you're a fan of Rube Goldberg, but a lot of times when I present on mediation, I put the Rube Goldberg machine up and I say, understanding mediation is important because if your environment doesn't have the same mediation paths that your target environment has, then you're not going to be able to scale or generalize. So think about the Rube Goldberg machine and how you need a lot of things to happen. You need to understand those in your AB, underneath your AB test to make sure that it will generalize, right? You need to understand the mediation path, but then you also need to understand moderators. And I talked about moderators with the, with the Parent Academy before. It only worked for some people. That was, that was a moderation effect. So Caitlin, I'm with you. I, I think the AB test is a start. But I think after that, you want to figure out for whom, why is this working? And does it, is it going to work across space and time? And that to me is about mediation and moderation. And that's about subtreatments. So you have AB, but then you have a ton of subtreatments as well. That makes sense, Caitlin? Yeah, that makes great sense. Uh, thank you, John. And if I can be selfish, I'll ask a quick follow up. Um, what are some of the sources of evidence to inform? Like, what are some key sources that some program developers can pull from to inform their A-B test? Well, gosh, you know what I'm going to say first, Caitlin, uh, the voltage effect. And then <laughs> second, about when you say to inform it. So think about, um, about check. I think you would have an idea, you'd write down an economic model about the education production function. And what that would say is it has some inputs, parental inputs, school inputs, maybe neighborhood inputs. And then you would want to think about how the program is augmenting those inputs. And then that would give, so economic theory does a pretty good job in that case of giving you what are the levers that you're going to have to pull to get the outputs that you want. And I think any program that I've ever dealt with, some simple economic theory gives you some inputs. And then previous literature gives you a bunch more inputs. Um, and then after that, you, you sort of use the experiment to test what are some other mechanisms that might be going on. Does that make sense, Caitlin? Yeah, that's great. Books on order. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> so I got two people to read the book, my dad and Caitlin. So thank oh, you. <laughs> oh, look at Mary. <laughs> Mary had to do that to get me to come. That's it. Um, we've all been talking about it. Great. Thank you for your question, Caitlin. We appreciate you joining us today. So are you able to just stick with us for a couple more minutes, John? Or just maybe one last question, if that's all right. Glad to. I, look, all of you are giving me your time. I'm happy to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I might just, I'll take one of these questions and I'll add on to it just in the last minute here. So we have a question about, you mentioned data and the importance of data science and how that can come into this overall. Um, so could you please get, speak a little bit about how data and behavioral science can help inform each other? And then I also have a question because of how, how we speak about behavioral science in the UN. Um, we often talk about RCTs, and, but we also talk about qualitative methods too. So yeah. how, do you, how do you leverage qualitative methods in, in your work too? So data and qual, Absolutely. how do you manage Absolutely. all of that in your, in your thinking? Yeah, let's start with the first one. It's a good question. So the first one, it sort of picks up on where Caitlin was. So an A-B test can measure something. It, it measures that, for example, B is better than A. So the program's better than the control. Now, every organization or every firm can do that. We've been, people have been doing that since the 70s, right? Doing credit card stuff and the, the famous social experiments. Everyone does that. Where we can really add is using behavioral science to figure out what are the sub-treatments that we should be using that will inform the whys behind why does B outperform A? So a good example is discrimination. I, I've done a fair amount of work on discrimination in markets. So about 20 years ago, I published a paper called The Nature and Extent of Discrimination in Markets. In economics, there are two major theories about discrimination. One is 
People have a taste for discrimination. They just hurt you because it makes them feel good. The second one is they discriminate because they want to make more money. It's called third degree price discrimination. Okay, so you go to a market, in nearly every market, there's some kind of discrimination going on. That's what uh, the data tell you. But it's not clear which of those types of discrimination is happening. And it's important to know because different policies will combat the two kinds of discrimination. So now that's behavioral science telling me I need to set up some subtreatments to figure out which of those types of discrimination is at work. That's what I do in that 2004 Nature and Extent of Discrimination paper. And that's an example about how behavioral science can inform what the subtreatments should be. Now think about any other. Why do people take an Uber trip? Why does my early childhood program work? Um, every, why do people give to charitable causes? Why do inner city schools fail? Why, why does this kind of climate change uh, household program work? All of those have conjectures that come from behavioral science. So the behavioral science is speaking to what kinds of data you should generate. Now, it goes the other way too. I generate some data, let's say qualitative data or what have you. I then try to reconcile the data with a, a theoretical understanding. Um, why are people behaving in this way? Well, the theory helps me. And then I say, okay, the theory helps reconcile that, but is it causal or correlational? Now I want to generate more data to figure out if the theory is correct. Now, just in general, of course, my career has focused on quantitative and focused on data. That doesn't suggest that the qualitative insights we gain from that style of research are wrong or, or misleading. They're compliments. And I, we all the time, we're gathering survey data uh, using conjoins. Or, or in fact, I just talked this morning with Walmart about we're trying to figure out what should go into the Walmart Plus Rewards Program. And I said, we should start with qualitative insights. We should start talking, do like an anthropological study that's along the lines of figuring out what do people want? Because in the end of the day, economics is about once you figure out what people want and what they desire and what they value, it's game over. Because economics tells you what are the mechanisms you can use to give people what they want. You know, what drives people? My tipping example earlier, people are driven by social norms and social pressures. That's important, it's fine. So once we understand that, we have mechanisms that, and institutions that we can set up. So I think in the end, all of these build to a better scientific knowledge base and we should be doing all of these kinds of research. Great, thank you for that That very interesting way of bringing the disciplines together and, and really concisely I'll summarizing a lot of the themes that we're seeing throughout this week. So thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. Um, so with that, we've already gone over time by five minutes. I'm sure we could go for much longer, but thank you very much for being with us. We've had a number of requests in the chat for the papers you mentioned. So maybe if you can send those to us, we can also pass them along to colleagues Absolutely. Um, so they can, they can see those as well. And, um, and yeah, so as mentioned, The Voltage Effect is the book if you want to know more about this. Um, it's been the talk of the behavioral science community for the last uh, while, and I think will be for a while too. Um, and if you'd like to say anything else, Professor Liss, before we close out, you have a few moments now. I just want to say thanks, Mary. Um, thanks, Johanna, for having me. And thanks for doing this week. What you're doing is bringing science to some of the most important parts of the world in the decision makers. I want to say thanks. Uh, as scientists, we appreciate what you're doing. You're trying to use some of the insights that, that we're generating. I can't wait to partner with you in the future and let's change the world for the better. Amazing, thank you so much. Looking forward to further discussions in this space and further work to move this forward overall. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully see you at some of the sessions uh, later on today and tomorrow. So thanks everyone, bye okay. now. Take care everyone, stay safe.